Hey, it's time for Voice Over Body Shop. It's raining in Southern California, but it's it's everything else everywhere else. We're all closed down, and uh, but George decided to do keep social distance. Yes, I'm six <laughs> feet away from you right now. <laughs> Stay away. You know, here's I've got sanitizing spray here. You know. <laughs> uh, anyway. Oh boy, got to keep a sense of humor through these times. Oh, and we've been, we've been laughing about it all afternoon. Uh, anyway, our guest tonight is Simon Vance. Simon, where hey, are you? I'm over here. I'm, I'm there. I'm he behind, is right the, there behind the screen, hiding. All right, <laughs> we've got audiobook stuff to talk about, and if you've got questions for Simon, throw them in the Facebook chat room, and there's still sort of the chat room in the homepage too. But it's time for Voiceover Body Shop. We got lots of great stuff to talk about with audiobooks and stuff. So stay tuned. From the outer reaches, they came, bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to voiceover body shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Hey there, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B.E.S. Yes. Yay. Right. We need applause. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, things are a little bit different. Uh, George, you are in your, your shack or your, wherever it is you're living now. Uh, <laughs> you can call it a shack. I'm not offended. Okay, good. I, I keep wondering. Very good. A very expensive shack in Topanga. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like a it's a it's a multi unit building. It's made from a lot of different things, isn't it? It is. It's it's multiple parts. But I'm in my studio space here, and uh, warm and cozy and dry. Yeah. I'm listening to the rain pouring over over top of us right now, yeah. and uh, it's just so bizarre when we're we're all, we're sort of quasi self quarantining right now and getting ready for what will probably become a full quarantine. And in the meantime, it's pouring rain, so you don't really want to go out. So we're getting a little taste of the Seattle life for a little while. Yeah, or Vancouver or, or Portland. Or Vancouver, or yeah. Places. Yeah, it's like, yeah, but it won't last. It'll be summer before we know it. And uh, But uh, everybody else, you remember, wash your hands, don't touch your face, use hand sanitizer. And don't go to the freaking bars and restaurants, even if they're open. Just don't. Don't yeah, do it. It's like what you know. Hang out with your family, you know, and you know, talk with them. That sort We're of. We're sorry. Yeah, it's but it's <laughs> it's it's how it's going to have to work. But we know. Get we, to know them. Yeah, but we know you guys have nothing else to do, so it's a perfect night to watch the show live because we have a fantastic guest, and he is now joining us from his brand new studio here in Southern California. Let's welcome Simon Vance. Simon. Yay! Hello. There he is. Hello. Right hang there. on a second. Hang on. Hang on. I can't talk to you yet. Hold okay. on. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Now I think I'm ready. You need to rub that on your vocal cords. And is you that gotta, what and you Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. And you got to do the thumbs too. Oh, the thumbs. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. I'm uh, good. Good. I'm good. Okay. All right. Hey guys. So it's it's been a while since we've seen you. You are actually in this interesting note here. 
the last time I think we saw you was at our third anniversary broadcast that we did live from in Irvine. And uh, so it's been six years. So believe it or not, it's actually our ninth anniversary of this show this, tonight. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I, I, uh, I, so much has happened in my life in those six years. And I, I know how many episodes do you do? You do one a week? So you've got hundreds more than... Oh yeah, we're 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 I think we're getting up to about four hundred right now. Yeah, the last uh, yeah. the last uh, nine years. Anyway, hey, have you yeah. ever narrated a pandemic novel? <laughs> um, you know, I I don't think I have. You know, when when I think of pandemics, for some reason I always think of Michael Crichton, and I think Scott Brick has that corner <laughs> that cornered. So um, you know, things weren't very good in charles dickens's time but uh, and they probably had a pandemic or two going around but nothing that the book was centered around the one thing i do know you know you mentioned that and i, I went flying uh, i flew to new york about a month ago maybe two months ago and my movie of choice was um was uh, the uh, uh what was it um, contagion. Out outbreak contagion that's the yeah, other yeah. one yeah the, the newer one contagion and i thought this is a great movie not thinking that right now <clears throat> left me with nightmares but that's um, like me i was flying to europe and the movie we watched right before we flew out there back in 1990 was die hard 2 and <laughs> many of you don't remember that movie but it starts with an airplane crashing yeah so not a good one right before you fly off to europe yeah mm -hmm. really no. so no. yeah so in in that time i mean audiobooks have always been around i mean there was the legendary books on tape back i remember in the 80s and 90s uh, how long have you been doing it? Well, clearly back from the legendary times. Yeah. Um, I I came over here in 92 um, from London. And even before that, when I worked at the BBC as a Radio 4 newsreader presenter, in my spare time, I, I, I gave an hour a week, a couple of hours a week, an afternoon a week, to the Royal National Institute for the Blind's Talking Book Service. I don't think it's called that quite now, but it was for the blind and partially sighted, as they said at the time. And I saw that as my um, my apprenticeship. Um, when I came over to the States, it was to be a full-time actor, um, but I, uh, you know, acting doesn't make much money. And somebody said, well, hey, audiobooks, are, you can make money in audiobooks. And I would always thought of it as a charity thing. Um, <laughs> but this friend uh, had some contacts and put me in touch with Blackstone Audiobooks, David Case, the late lamented David Case. Who actually died 15 years ago. It's hard to imagine. I've been in the business way too long. Um, but he introduced me to Blackstone, Craig Black at Blackstone Audiobooks, and I started with them. I did uh, books on tape uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, and then around about uh, 2001 was when I recognized that was actually an industry out there. And I went to New York for an event when the hotels were cheap. It was actually 2002 and um, met a lot of people. And as a result of that, got hooked up with Tantor. And, and a couple of others, and I never really looked back. The, the you know the, the burgeoning MP3 business. Uh, if you can remember those days when there were no, there was no MP3. You only yeah. lived off discs, or or prior to that, just tapes. Hence the books on tape. But then it all became um, you know digital, and uh, never really looked back from that moment on. And I, yeah, it's hard to think now. 2020. I've been in here for 28 years. My goodness! Great. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So. You you are the master of audiobooks. I mean, if you oh. if you were doing it before people even knew they existed. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> before I knew they existed, to be honest. I mean, somebody sent me a check. I, I knew nothing about the industry. And it was so strange to go into New York and, and meet people who did this as a job and saw it as a career. Because at the time, the story I have from the early days was that um, I knew that some actors, some audiobook narrators used different names for different companies. Um, I think it was something to do in the 80s with them um, having what, their own stable of, of uh, presenters, of readers. Um, and I chose to use a different name because I thought, if I'm not very good at audiobooks, <laughs> I don't want it to hinder my burgeoning film career. So I went on the name uh, Robert Whitfield with Blackstone and Richard Matthews with books, Richard Matthews with books on tape. And there are still those books out there. Um, and then it wasn't until things started happening and I started winning awards that I realized my burgeoning film career was going to have to take a back seat. Um, and so I ended up going with Simon Vance, which seems to be working it, pretty it, well. For it, it, it would seem. You can see a few of the awards I've got back there. 
<laughs> yes, you should be polishing them right now. But it, I should be, shouldn't yeah, I? Yeah. 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 This is this is one of the nice things about having a new studio is I've somewhere to put them because often they were just in boxes for ages and I finally got them all out. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk about those. Our guest tonight is Simon Vance, uh, a guy who just does the best audio books out there. And uh, if you've got a question for him, throw him in the Facebook uh, discussion there or in the chat room in our on our homepage, depending on where you're watching. And uh, because right now we're live. Those of you watching this recorded, you had your chance. Anyway, uh, so. You now you mentioned that you know you were a you were also an actor, and I think this is something that a lot of people who are getting into audiobooks or into voiceover tend to overlook. That if you want to do audiobooks, especially if you want to do novels where you're doing all these different characters, acting is really what it's about, and it's not about doing funny voices and just reading. If you're an actor, you've got a real you've got a real advantage over everybody. Yeah, I, I call it having an actor's sensibility. And I, cause I, I remember way back people saying, well, do you need to be an actor to be an audiobook narrator? And I, I, I say that you don't need to be an actor, but you've got to have an actor's sensibility, um, which is sort of a bit of an obfuscation, I suppose. But, but if you think about it this way, that as an actor, you develop certain skills in the way you think about uh, the way characters interact. You have a certain empathy for different people. It's not just you. In the audiobook world, you're playing everybody on the stage, and you have to be able to sort of jump between those characters. And as an actor, those uh, those are skills that sort of can be uh, trained. You, you know, you you take classes and so on. But there are people who can walk in to a movie as an actor. Um, uh, and if you're not, <clears throat> I'm getting kind of tied up in knots here. But it's really if you're if you're not actually a professional actor, but you have an actor's sensibility, you've probably got a chance at making it in audiobooks. But if you're not an actor, and you don't understand acting, then I think you're kind of stuck. And I think that even goes for nonfiction books that you'd think, well, you know, I know the technical aspects of this and I'll just read it. But you've got to be able to not only, you know, understand it yourself, you've got to see how it sounds to somebody you're speaking to, that you've got to be able to put yourself in the other person's position. So it's, it's about talking, working on different levels, three or four different levels. And I think actors, especially stage actors, are trained to do that. You're not, you've got to think while you're in this Victorian drama, um, you've got to uh, understand that you've got to point yourself in a particular direction. You're not just doing the one thing, you're doing three or four different things. You've got to time things right, you've got to say the right cues, you've got to do this, do that. So it's all about uh, working on so many different levels. And I think actors uh, are the people who are trained best to do that. And as I say, not being an actor, but having an actor's sensibility, there are certain people who have that skill naturally. So, to cut it short, you do have to be an actor. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, you know, sometimes people just jump in and they're like, they're you know, like you said, they're a natural, and yeah, they, that's they one of me. And they can they can just start reading it, and it's like, well, it's, you know, it's, but it's not about having a great voice; it's the ability to use your voice. That's right. You can tell I don't teach because otherwise I'd have this down as a, as a way to speak <laughs> about it. But I, I bumble along and eventually you'll get the gist of what I'm saying. And I remember um, talking one thing and, and, and every so often somebody would have to come in at one, one of these teaching sessions, somebody come in and say, I think what Simon means is this. So, Dan, if you can do that for me while I bumble along, you can say, well, I think what you're saying is. What, what you're saying is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what have you been working on lately? Um, I'm in the middle of more fantasy. I've, I've become very popular with fantasy writers, apparently, and, and the publishers. Um, so I'm in the middle of books. That's good and bad. So many uh, fantasies are coming through as I think they've been taken as self-published by the, uh, you know, the writer has not come through a, a hardback copy and you know, hasn't, ha hasn't had his books proofed and, and checked and so on. And the, and the publishers, the audio publishers pick them up because they've got a good following. So the, the text on the page is not the easiest thing to, to pick up from. So I'm, I'm stuck in a book right now, and I won't mention any names, but it's a little difficult to read and, and to, to tell the story correctly. It's one of the challenges yeah. that uh, are much more, uh, we, we come across much more often these days. In the old days, it was all fancy books like Charles Dickens, Anthony Trollope, and, and major authors. Now there's a lot more stuff because everything's getting done. All the books are getting done. So I'm doing that. As it happens, my next book, as I look on my calendar, is Pickwick Papers. 
it's one of the few Charles Dickens books I haven't read. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I've got a couple more. Um, I've got a couple more uh, fantasy books beyond that, and a uh, a mystery, a murder mystery. So very busy right now, which yeah. is wonderful, and I'm in a very fortunate position given the current climate. Yeah. How do how do you how do you approach these different genres? I mean, because fantasy is, I mean, is it the same type of style of just reading characters? But usually they're more extreme and more animated characters, I would think. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the one difference is how much you lean into creating the characters. Um, I don't see it as it's a different genre necessarily. Um, I know there's there's some people say, well, it's this kind of genre, you read it this way. If it's this kind of genre, you read it that way. Um, they're all people, even in fantasies, the elves, you know, they're written as people. The, the trolls are written as people. They just sound different. Um, even if you're doing a, a, you know, Charles Dickens compared to a, a modern um, murder mystery, they're all people. It's just the Charles Dickens characters are probably a little broader, a little brighter, a, a little, uh, th there's more humor in them. But they're not quite as as natural as, as the murder mystery. Um, the fantasy books, yeah, you just got to tell the story in the same way you tell a Charles Dickens or a murder mystery. You're just telling the story. It's just the trolls will will wear your throat out quicker. Um, my elves tend to mostly have Welsh accents, just because I think I think Welsh sounds very good for somebody with a little mystery about them. You know, I, I just thought elves mystery. were Welsh. I mean, it, well, yeah. most of them, as far as I know, the ones I Norwegian. I've met, or... Norwegian, yes. No, I've got a I do, I've got one guy who's yeah Germanic. I think I've put in the, the fantasy. You know, you can as long as you talk to the author or get the notes from the author about how they view their world. Um, it's a little like Game of Thrones. You can do it with characters, if they're all in the Northern land, you can give them a Northern English accents. And if they're Southern and exotic, you can go a little bit more, you know, a little bit uh, you know, Middle Eastern or something like that. Not that that's a Middle Eastern accent, but I'm doing my best here. But it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a choice. Um, and I think you can go broader in fantasy than you do with others. But the actual telling of the story is pretty much exactly the same. You need to understand where you're going. You need to understand who the good guys are, the bad guys are. You need to do your research. Um, so there isn't really a, a difference in fantasy you know, compared to horror and stuff. And you certainly don't. You know, one of the fatal horror mistakes would be to to put on a voice as the narrator, as the third person narrator. Go, this is a horror story, so I'm going to read it like this. Because right. people get tired very quickly. So you just have to use a natural voice and uh, um, and tell the story as it's written. Interesting. Oh, good. Again, if you've got a question for Simon, throw it in the Facebook chat room or on the chat room on our homepage, depending on where you are. And because uh, I know there's a lot of you out there that are audiobook narrators and you're now we're talking to one of the best here. And he probably has the answer for you. Uh, so I, I see you in your brand new studio there. I've been mm -hmm. watching been watching the progression as you've been building this thing. Uh, you know, it's it sort of started out looking like a garden shed. And, and now it's uh, it's well, really something. Well, it kind of it, it is a glorified garden shed. I, I I used a company online called Studio Shed to help design it. Um, they they come in prefabricated form from some other state, and then you have a local contractor who puts it together. So it's not built from scratch here, um, and it's more I call it more of a creative space than a studio. It's not built as a studio in the sense of being soundproofed here. What I have, and I will show you, is the same vocalbooth.com that I had six years ago, or even, I think I've had it 15 years now, but it's sitting here beside me. I shall move this around okay. and show you. This is my, it's the, the usual six foot by four foot, um, seven feet high, and I open. And uh, yeah, so I have this situated in the middle in the middle of the room um, and it's actually wonderfully soundproofed because it's a double walled vocal booth um, so it's already pretty well soundproofed and with the actual studio shed which is not just a shed it's fully finished inside um, this room it, it means it's so quiet down here and I'm at the bottom of my garden you can see um, very that. blurry through my studio window you can see through to the house right um, there it is move my hand the right way um, the house is way up there, about 75 feet away. So we're well down the garden, a long way away, which uh, makes my wife very happy because she can now make 
as much noise in a house as she liked, which, <laughs> which she couldn't do before. Um, so I've got that situated in the middle. Um, I have, as you saw behind me, my guitars and uh, my awards. This is my Pink Floyd wall. I've got posters. Oh, Pink cool. Floyd. I also, I have the gear here because I'm also um, trying to do acting, trying to do full on TV and film acting, break back into the industry here. Um, a lot of self tape happens these days, even more right now. So I've got the, uh, I've got a back, a screen, and I hang that across and a camera I can set up. And I've got lights. I've got a key light up in the corner. I see. You can see up there. So um, I've got that. Um, if I turn back to where I was, you can see where my, that's where I do my editing on my iMac. And I've got another window there, which looks out on the part of the garden. Um, and then if I come along past the studio, slowly so we don't shudder too much. Um, this half of the room is my, I think you called it before we were talking the producer's corner. I called it sort of the green room. Mm -hmm. um, and not just because of the door, but I have, uh, I have a couch set up over here. So I can relax between books. And uh, I got a TV set, TV here, which is linked up to computer as well. So I can do all kinds of online study and things that I like to do. Yeah. Um, and uh, I may be able to take you outside just for a second. I've got this wonderful door knocker that I bought in Baltimore uh, nearly Ooh. two years ago. Ooh, a Poe a po knocker. <laughs> a proper door knocker. And then uh, as long as the signal holds up, it's raining, as you can see. This is the outside. Uh, that's how it looks. Wow. It's not um, aesthetically the most wonderful thing, but it, uh, it does the purpose. Serves the purpose very well. Yeah. Well, once and, you get some uh, plants around the outside there, it'll probably be fine. That's right. Actually, there's a nice blank screen on one side, and I think we could put a shield, uh, put a screen up there and play movies in the middle of the summer. Oh, always get fun. Some friends over. So that should be good. Anyway, that's the space. Yeah. And, so, uh, so essentially, it's a man cave. <laughs> it is exactly a man cave. Let me just plug in again to make sure we don't go out of power. Whoops. Yeah. Um, it really is. And I was squeezed up in the, you know, the, the development over the years has been amazing. I started in the garage in uh, Concord 28 years ago and moved into various closets. I then have a, would have a dedicated bedroom. Um, and then where did I go? I mean, just different places. And I, I moved this studio several, several times. I had two studios at one point because I was living in the house up in Concord and we were renting down in L.A. And I wanted the same size studio in both places and just moved the equipment backwards and forwards. But then we moved down here. We bought this house three years ago and I was in the third bedroom. But it meant that my wife Cynthia couldn't do anything in the kitchen because any noise at all would travel through the walls. And uh, basically, um, it was very restricting. And uh, now that I'm out, the timing is perfect because she's a teacher at uh, UC Irvine. And she has, as of now, been restricted to teaching from a distance yeah. online teaching only when they come back after spring break so she's now taken over the third bedroom herself as her own teaching space and she'll be able to do what her thing up there well i can do my thing down here yeah well they're, they're eventually because i have the same situation here someone will develop space envy uh <laughs> They're like, how come I can't yeah. come out there? You know, so yeah. well, that's right. We can we come down and have a cup of tea in here sometimes. It is so quiet because there's not even the sound of a refrigerator buzzing or, or 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 any kind of the air conditioning doesn't make a noise, and it's just so delightful. I had the contractor in just after I moved the studio in here, and he was finishing something off. And he came in. I said, "Do you want to go step inside the studio and see what it's like?" He said, "Yeah," and he came out. He was like, he was a little bit freaked. He said, "All I can hear is my is the ringing in my ears." <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know what tell them to remember what that's like and so now when somebody asks what is a quiet you know what is quiet air conditioning or whatever now they now they know how yeah. quiet really quiet truly is it is it is pretty remarkable yeah i'm yeah. loving it yeah I'm that's that's a, a duckless system right yeah yeah i mean it was just on the corner of, it's the uh, it's the, the the actual air conditioning if i take it back i walked past it too quickly is up on the wall here that is the minivac there. Yeah, those are great. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Just that box, and out the back is a is a small um, a unit. A that probably measures a yard by a foot by a couple of feet, and uh, there's a little tube comes through the wall. 
and that's it. Yeah, that's why they're so darn quiet. You know, yeah. that even the yeah. unit outside is pretty quiet. And then the one inside is remarkably yeah. quiet. And then just, just a couple little wires and pipes between them. That's it. Yeah. You got Europeans to... have had them for years, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Japanese, they really have almost, they almost invented them practically. Mitsubishi mm -hmm. and Samsung and on and on. Yeah. George, you got some questions about a studio? Yeah, just um, more a little bit more about um, your technical workflow. Like, um, what do you like to record through? What software? And then, you know, are you sending out finished versus mastered files? Yeah. It depends on well, the book, the, I would imagine. Yeah, the equipment, um, you know, hasn't changed over the years. And it's, I, I never, the advantage of starting now is you can take advice from wonderful people like George Whitham and only buy what you need. Um, I've collected all kinds of, crap over the years um sure i've got lots of lo leftover stuff but what i do have i i i and i've got a u87 a neumann u87 microphone um i've worked my way through tlm 103s and 486s whatever and um but i settled on this one time i was testing microphones and i thought i'll try the u87 i hope i don't like it because it's too darn expensive but it's the one that i like the most so i kept it i'm very happy i did um the software i have a mac mini for my computer because I originally up in Concord had the studio in a separate room from where I like to edit. So I had two computers. So I have, I still have two computers. I have a Mac mini. Um, my microphone goes into the, uh, I've got a, a universal audio Apollo twin. Um, I've got a Grace, I got the M103. I think the 101 would have been perfectly adequate, but I got the 103 and I got the Mac mini. Um, I record to the Mac Mini. I, the software I use is Steinberg's Wave Lab, and I have no absolute preference except for the fact that this was the first uh, software I ever used. I went into the store in 1996, I think it was. I think I was one of the first home narrators to ever go digital, and I, I, I figured this would be good to do, um, and there was no internet to do any research at the time. So I went into a music store, and they gave me Cubase. Steinberg's Cubase. Oh, geez. It's about 50 discs and way more than I ever needed. And, and somewhere in the middle of it was WaveLab 1.0. So I started using that, went out to WaveLab 10.1 something, and I've stuck with it because, of course, you get discounted upgrades and so on. Um, and I've, I've just got used to it and I love it. So um, that's what I use uh, to record. Um, I then transfer the files over to my iMac, 27 uh, inch iMac here. And uh, again, I edit on Steinberg's WaveLab. Um, and the way I record is I don't do punch and roll. I never have. Part of that, and I don't want to get into an argument with anybody about what's better, because I went through that years ago. Every time I'd pop up on Facebook and say, oh, but I like straight record, everybody would try to tell me, oh, punch and roll is the only way to go. I actually think straight record is the best way, except it is harder for beginners. It's much harder. You need the experience of, of um, I don't know, you need studio training, I think, to do it properly, do um, straight record properly. And I grew up working for the BBC and editing tapes reel to reel and so on. Um, so um, I work straight record. Yes. That's, <laughs> that's interesting because I, I had the impression that punch and roll required a little bit more acumen because you're actually live operating the system while narrating. But you're saying no, not the other, it's kind of the other way around. Yeah, explain, I, I find explain that's more. Well, publishers, 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 um, or publishers. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they actually prefer if you do the whole punch and roll session and they get everything you've done. Um, the, if it's set up, because they, they can set things up for beginners is punch and roll, basically, so there's only a couple of buttons to press. You know, you look at the waveform, you if you've flubbed, you look at the waveform, see where the gap is, you drop your mark and you press go and it plays your few seconds beforehand and slips into record and you're supposed to be able to continue straight on. And you do that through the book and you basically don't have to touch the file except to do the consolidation. Whereas my way, and, and you're in, you end up with, um, you know, the last take you did is what you end up consolidating and sending off. And if the publisher has the whole package, you know, every single retake you did, if they need to, they can go back in. And it's, it's very funky, but it's, it's for the publishers, trained engineers to work on. And the person at home has only ever had to press the button and, and start it and stop it and start it and stop it. For a straight record, I run through, drop a marker if I make a mistake, 
And if I do two or three takes, all the takes are there. At the end of the session or the next day or even a week later, I'll go back to tidy it up and I'll go from marker to marker. And I will then, I can do what wave layer, what, 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 um, what a um, punch and roll would do, which is basically just do a straight match from the last take to the next take. But I can do it with more detail. It doesn't just crossfade. I can do it with the breath. I can do an edit in the middle of a word. I can take the beginning of the third take and put it to the second part of the fourth, first take uh, and do finesse things like that, which to me gives me way more control over the finished product. Um, and I think a cleaner, cleaner piece of work, which I then send to the publisher, who's very happy with what I've sent because it's pretty clean and they don't have the crossfades and the cut. Right. The cut breaths, which you can get with uh, punch and roll. Yeah, yeah. I've always so that's, yeah, that's yeah. I, I've always thought that you know the, the punch and roll takes away those extra takes that you do uh, because you might have done two or three takes of a line, and then suddenly it's like you know, you go back and 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 you and it's gone because you went and you rolled back and 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 recorded over it. So it's always good to save all that stuff that's there and go back and find the best part to do it. Yeah. yeah. And my understanding though is that Pro Tools, the whole session will it'll keep previous sessions. It'll keep previous takes. Right. But it'll file them away. But you and then you have to send the whole package to right. the publisher yeah. for them to have and, access and to. And you it. gotta go find it somewhere. All right. Yeah. We're gonna take a quick break right now. If you've got a question for Simon, throw it in the Facebook uh discussion and uh, we'll get it to him in the next segment here. So stay tuned, we'll be right back after these. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The VoiceOver Body Shop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies. Because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. So, Levelator. It did a great job of RMS normalization for audiobook content and podcast episodes. But it's orphaned software which means no one's developing it anymore. And now it doesn't work with the latest Macs and Catalina Mac OS. So you're stuck, right? Well, not anymore. Behold the gooey goodness of Audio Cupcake. Visit audiocupcake.com and download the free Audio Cupcake app for Macintosh. Audio Cupcake does exactly what Levelator did so well for so long. It applies RMS normalization to your audio and it preps your work for ACX. And it does it so well with Mac OS, including Catalina. Just like with Levelator, you drag and drop your audio file onto the Audio Cupcake window, and out pops an RMS normalized file. But Audio Cupcake goes even further. Unlock the premium features of Audio Cupcake, and what pops out? audio that is both RMS and peak normalized and converted to a 192K mono MP3 file ready for uploading to ACX or your podcast platform. That's delicious audio goodness. Audio Cupcake is available free at audiocupcake.com. That's audiocupcake.com. Audio Cupcake, a beautiful, simple way to master your audio narration and podcasts. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? 
go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. And we're back here on Voice Over Body Shop with our guest Simon Vance. And, you know, there's audiobooks is probably a little bit more complicated than people think. Uh, yeah. So we've got a yeah. little... <laughs> We, we have a lot of people with a lot of questions So uh, for Simon. So why don't we start with those? Sure. Um, yeah, there's a couple different feeds of questions, some from our website chat room and some from Facebook, but also email. Yep. And uh, should we start with that email one from Brad? Yep. You're a little loud Multiple there, Jorge. Part. Oh, sure. Let me give you a little less heat. Thank you. One, two, three, four. How's that look? A little I think bit. that's probably better. Okay. Go for it. Okay, so this first one is from Brad, Brad Avenue. It's a multi-part question. <laughs> so one we'll... A, one, one, one A, two, two A, <laughs> yes. three, yeah. four A. It I'm sure is. <laughs> so pick the nice one. <laughs> um, he's coming in from Toronto. Um, he's washed his hands, so he's got a mitt full of questions. Um, are there types of audiobook narration projects that you favor doing? Um, and, are, and are those particular types projects you tip and are there others that you would actually try to avoid that's the second part of that question okay shall i answer that you should um i uh, um there are definitely books i favor recording um and my i think the best way to describe those particular books are that they're well written um there's i've described reading books that are well written as, as there's really no not much work involved uh, i can it's like skating across water. It's, it's I'm dancing, I'm singing. It's, it's a glorious feeling. If a book is badly written, it's like wading through mud. Uh, it's hard to bring the story to life. Um, and this is not just grammatical structure and so on, it, although it, a lot of it is the use of words and the use of language. A, a lot of it is, is how the story is structured. Um, the uh, the characters do they make sense? Are they doing sensible things? There's nothing worse than reading books that uh, the, the author is sort of following a formula. Um, so it, yes, there are books I favour. There's not a particular genre. There are certain writers I love. I mean, I have to say my favourite writer is a guy called Guy Gabriel K, Canadian writer from ah, Toronto, as it happens. Uh, he lives in Toronto. And he's, um, he's written, I just did one uh, earlier last year called A Brightness Long Ago, which was just glorious. He wrote Tigana, which is a beautiful book. And, and there's so many books he's done. And I've done a lot of the, uh, maybe 10 of his books now. And he's, he's glorious. I loved reading Charles Dickens. Um, anything that's, that's well written. Um, and there's all How long does it take Sorry. to get into the, how far into the book do you pre-read before you go, eh? Uh, <laughs> not gonna happen well here's here's the problem you know you get given um, work and it's hard to say no to it and you know i get let's let's say it's a, a bad fantasy or something and i it, it's 20 hours long and i start reading it in, in prep and in most of the prep in in that for me is uh working out how to pronounce names uh working out the world that we're in you know i described you know the, the, the accents to use is this a say, could I see this as being around the Mediterranean? Or is this a sort of like England top to bottom? Or is it like the whole of Europe? And can I use Russian voices and things like that? But it's mostly names, pronunciations, and so on and so forth. Uh, and getting into the story, I will scan the story and take a look. It's not, often it's not until I'm right in the story that I realize how badly put together it is, which is unfortunate. And, and I remember, and I don't want to, you know, put down authors because it's a heck of a job writing a book. I know that. Um, 
but I can remember way back when I got one of his first problematic books, talking to the publisher about it. And uh, they, they said, well, there's an audience for it out there. People love this stuff. They love this particular writer or, or, or this new writer is getting a lot of feedback, good feedback on Goodreads. And, and I recognized that my judgment doesn't really matter. I, I need to make it work as best I can because the audience deserves it. People are buying these books and they love these kind of stories. And my own judgment may be a bit more snobbery than anything else that, um, you know, I've got used to Charles Dickens. How dare I read this? this nonsense, but there are people who, who love those kind of stories. So I need to sort of bury that and just see this as, as part of the job. But I have to say, there is a sense of that it's, it's like wading through mud sometimes to bring this stuff up to life. Whereas so when you have the you know, these, these uh, fictional books, yeah. how do you keep track of all those characters? Because you're obviously assigning characters to voices to yeah. these characters. How do you keep track? Um, <clears throat> but immediately, there's a sense of you picture them in your head who they might be but you also um, in terms of, of, of how you see them how their how their character is developing um, and you can attach a voice to that actor you know you it can either be a real actor or, or just uh, you know uh, an actor in real life like that's my Alec Guinness voice or that's my Christopher Lee voice or something like that um, uh, you can do that or you, you can make up a character but you you link it to that image in your head so that whenever they crop up you know who they are but you also write down you make notes and you save audio files of their voices sometimes um i often don't do the full-on recording for future reference until i get to the end of the book um people have different ways of doing it i'm not saying my way is the best way it's probably one of the most efficient inefficient ways of doing it but at the end of the book when I finish, I will often make one file and say, you know, this is this character and he speaks like this. This is this character and she speaks like this. And this is this character and she speaks like that. So that I've got a, a couple of minutes of a file that I can go back. And then when the next part of the fantasy series returns, because that's usually when, when I'm doing a book, I don't usually forget from beginning to end what the characters sound like. Uh, and if I, if I have a momentary hesitation, I've got the files right in front of me and I can go back, find the character in the book, and find the file. But at the end of it, I don't want to have to do that every time I, I start a new volume. So I'll, I'll run through this little recording that I've made as, as a guide. And as I say, you've got a list. Um, often the, the writer will give you a list of the main characters. They'll, they'll, if we're fortunate, they'll give you an outline of the story. So there's a lot of different ways of doing it. People have different ways of, of um, you know, using using the resources available. Yeah, I, that best that basically answers a few questions that also came in from Paul Matthews. So thanks because he was asking about all of that. Right. Um, and then we got Rob Ryder. Raider. Um, sorry, thank you, Raider. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and my last name is not Whitman. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I know how that feels. Um, Simon, do you do your own editing? Um, you mentioned that you do some, but how do you handle the consistency of characters? You did answer that just now, but how do you, uh, do you always have to add to your own editing? Is it just depend on the production house you're working for? Well, uh, no, it's a pretty much standard. Um, every time I, I do, I like to send a clean file from my studio to the publisher. It's not necessarily all correct. It's not necessarily all the right words in the right order. That's for the proofer to discover. Yes. I don't do the proofing, but I will always do my best to send a clean file. So I will do all the work I need to do to, to make it clean. If I was doing, and I did do punch and roll a couple of times. Basically, if you punch and roll, once you come out of the studio, you've got a clean file. It's not as clean as I would like it, but it's basically what you send up to the publisher. If you're really good with punch and roll, and I know there are narrators who good narrators who, who live by that. They can do very nice work with punch and roll. But I still prefer, as we've talked about, having the hands-on approach with the straight record. And I, I send that off. And it, it will always go through a proofer. Um, and depending on the publisher and the importance of the title, it may go through two or three levels of, of QCing and proofing just to make sure it's correct. And I will then receive the uh, corrections back in, in uh, you know, written form, the list of mistakes, the pages, and hopefully an audio match as well. So I can listen to what I did then and imitate it. And I send those back and that's for them to put into the uh, 
ah, yeah. into this book. And if I, if it's an ACX book, which is, um, and we've been talking about this, but it's if you're doing the direct work with the publisher, which I do sometimes, with the uh, author, which I do sometimes, which there is no publisher there, then I will take on the production responsibilities and I will hire a separate engineer and proofer to do the work that the uh, a publisher would normally do. But it'll work in the same way. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, you don't take on that load of doing those jobs. You know, that's, it's kind of like running a little business and then deciding all of a sudden, no, maybe I will sweep the floors today. Yeah, and it, it sounds like a good idea to, to save money to do it yourself. But the one thing I would say to any audiobook narrator is never, never proof yourself, ever. Because the mistakes you made the first time round, you will probably make the second time and you will miss the words that you should have got. You know, you need a different ear. And I... And I know that from experience because in the mid 90s, late 90s, business wasn't very good. And I offered to proof a couple of my own books and you know, some of the same mistakes I, uh, you know, came through and got picked up way later on by listeners. So oh, I by know. listeners. Yeah, they you live on. Yeah, <laughs> they're permanent. They'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, the classic one is I did a book, um, the, a biography of Ian Fleming for Blackstone Audiobooks. It's by a British author. Um, I got given the book to do and at one point. Ian Fleming uses the F word uh, liberally, and he was quoted in the book. Now, somehow, and this was 1997 or 1998, I had a year or so with digital editing. And you know, cut and paste, you gotta be careful when you've got something that you've just cut and pasted, that you don't then cut and paste it somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> a year after the book came out, there was a, there was a, they got letters or a couple of letters because apparently this F word was suddenly dropped into some random place in the book. <laughs> a mistake, I know. And that was me proofing my own stuff. Bad mistake. There you go. And that's Everybody the listening out there? there? Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, DJ Dwayne has an interesting question. Where do you get most of your book deals? ACX? Or you have an agent, though, don't you? Well, I'm very fortunate. No, I, I actually, agents don't, and, and unless you're an actor who does maybe one audio book a year the, and get paid vast sums of money for it, um, agents are not really interested in audio books because it, it's, it's uh, I don't know, we've said, talked about this, but it's, audio books is one of the lowest paid but in terms of time uh, businesses in the voiceover um, arena. Um, I get my books directly from the publisher. Um, and I'm in that fortunate position because I've been in the industry so long. Um, I made my mark early on and publishers know me and I'm in their catalogs, you know, so when they, they think of a book, they'll go, oh, there's people on the sign. Um, at least I hope they do. Um, the, uh, there, are, uh, there are a couple of places now where you can put auditions in. Um, you can register yourself. And ACX is obvious, is an obvious one. But Pendri Penguin Random House has a hat. This is not for beginners, I should say. Um, you know, you, you, if you've got experience and you've proven you can do so many books, then you can upload a profile to, to this Ahab um, website and, and Penguin Random House. And they're opening it to other um, producers who can go in there and listen to auditions and then hire you directly. So I think in the audiobook industry, I don't think anybody who's a professional full-time narrator will ever use a, will, will have a, an agent work for them. Um, but they will try to make contact with producers, publishers directly. Um, that's where they come from. The other way, of course, is if, if you're beginning, you can't go straight to a publisher. ACX is a good way to start. Um, I have to say it has its own challenges, which should probably be better discussed elsewhere because it's a whole, it's a whole session of its own. Um, but uh, that's that's another way where you can make direct contact with authors and do deals with authors. Well, speaking of recording, you know, ACX style or, or when you do your little edit cleanups, are you one of those miracle voice actors that just doesn't make mouth noise? Because Jeff Holman wants to know, <laughs> how are you dealing with mouth noise? And if you do, do you use R RX or something like that? No, I don't. I don't do any processing. Um, uh, publishers don't like you to do processing on your files. I do. A, I have a very very subtle noise gate, um, which is, which is, a, I, I don't like to even admit that I do because again, it can be really misused and affect the recording in a terrible way. And I only put it in, in, uh, in post at my end, it makes my cleanup editing cleaner. And it, it is such a subtle thing. Um, and I have such a low nose, not nose floor, publishers and nose floors. It's amazing. Anyway, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, 
that I don't. So I and I don't go in and and do any cleanup of clicks and crackles. Am I someone who doesn't have my? No, I'm not. I'm very aware. Another reason I like straight record is that if I hear myself do a mouth noise, I can just do a quick quick repick. And I've done that today. I did a long. I've done three hours of recording in here today, and and I know I'm aware. Sometimes when I hear my mouth go, then I I'll redo that particular sentence. Um, I'm sure other mouth noises slip through. I think I am pretty good though about mouth noise. Um, well, it's it, you I, sound I, human that way, and that's also very important yeah, as well. You do, again, that's one of the issues with with doing processing after the fact. You don't want to make yourself sound inhuman. You know, you, you make breath. You don't edit out breath. People argue, oh, I edit out all my breath. Don't do that. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, when I hear that on audiobook, I'm like, what? Who told you that? <laughs> Who told you to deep breath your audiobook? Yeah. Um, yeah, mouth noise voice actors are so hypersensitive to them because they're listening back, you know, through really. <laughs> it's a skill, and... you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an actor, a voice actor in audiobooks, it, it is a skill you need to learn. If you have a lot of breaths, you're going to have to work on removing them and removing them yourself naturally, not using an artificial method to, to, to lose them. You, you maybe need to take some coaching. You know, I took uh, breath lessons when I was a kid because my parents sent me to a drama school in, on Saturday morning. So I have an understanding of breath control. And as an audiobook narrator, breath control is, is every bit as important in some ways as, as having that actor's sensibility I talked about because you have to talk for so long and you can't be heard to be running out of breath at the end of the sentence and start in with the next one. It's a, it's a skill that you learn over time. All right. We got time for one more question here from uh, Steve Campbell. And this is actually kind of an interesting one. How often do you record at home versus in studio or do you actually go into any of the studios at all anymore? I, I do occasionally, very rarely. I'm, I started as a home narrator. I narrated constantly at home until about 2002 uh, and then uh, i remember penguin random house called me to do something in new york um and i worked with paul allen rubin and his wife and i also did a book for macmillan i can remember laura wilson sitting there after the first two two or three sessions saying you've got a studio at home haven't you you're fine on your own because i'm a very good um director self-director um, and it's uh, it's cheaper for them if and if they can trust me to to do it to bring the product out. Now there's um, I went in last year because I did um, George R R Martin's uh, Fire and Flood, the history of the Targaryens, and that was a book that was a, a very important book for Penguin Random House. They wanted to make sure it was done properly. Um, I think there were NDAs signed and everything else, so they didn't want you know, scripts running around all over the place. Um, so I went in. That's probably the last. Oh, I did go into Deanne and do a couple of books for Oasis Audio. That's because they had a relationship with Deanne. And I fancied going to another studio. But that was that was a couple of months ago. And I did a couple of short books there. But no, it's I would say 99 percent now. Um, I haven't done any major books other than that George Martin book for about a decade in a studio. Mm. All right. Well, Simon, thanks so much for joining us again here on Voice Over Body Shop. And, uh, you know, if uh, people want to hear your stuff, you're, you're available, I guess, just about anywhere fine audiobooks are procured. This is true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. We'll see you soon. We'll get together for coffee when all of this stuff ends. Oh, I love to. Yes. What people don't know is it's like the CNN car park deal where the guys were just next door you're only actually next door and george is next door that way so right you know we're so close we can meet for coffee in fact i'll come over in a few minutes okay there we go all right thanks simon we'll talk to you soon simon vance all righty we'll be right back and wrap things up a nice tight little ball right after this awesome this is anthony mendez you're watching Voice over body shop. 
Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. All right, it's time to talk about voiceoveressentials.com. So, while supplies last, buy a VO1A microphone and get a Vox pop stop filter free or their voice optimized headphones and get a free headphone hanger the mxl v01a faithfully captures deep tones without sounding bassy and has a silky smooth top that is never harsh a perfect sound palette for both male and female voiceover performers it's the voiceover microphone the vox pop stop blocks the pops not your script and like our voiceover microphone, our voice-optimized headphones were designed for voice work from the get-go. While musicians and many consumers choose headphones because of their eardrum-rattling bass, open back, and on-ear design, they're a poor choice for voice work. We need to hear the clear, transparent, and honest sound of our voices without artifice and affectation. Our Voice Optimized Headphones 2.0 provide both that accurate transparent sound and enhanced mid-range audio. A less bass and a creature comfort voice over workers deserve. And to keep your headphones safe, secure, in easy reach, and off the floor, just clamp on the all-metal VOHH headphone hanger on your microphone or copy stand. The non-slip groove nylon tip and installed stock rubber backing pads prevent scratching your equipment and your headphones from experiencing whoops i've fallen on the studio floor and i can't get up get them all now while supplies last at voiceoveressentials.com first come first served thanks harlan hey everybody it's time to talk about source elements you know who they are the creators of source connect that tool that you don't have what you don't have it you should have it it's that tool that allows you to connect your studio to other studios around the world so they can record you from your booth. Uh, it's a tool you should have because even if you're not being asked for it now, you might be asked for it tomorrow or in a month or in a year. You want to have it ready to go and know how to use it. It's really the heir apparent to ISDN technology, and it is definitely what the pros are using. You can go ahead and sign up for a 15-day free trial of Source Connect over at SourceElements.com. Get it up and running. Get your iLock account in order. There's a little video on there. I'll teach you how to do it by yours truly. And it'll help you get up and running so you can understand how it all works. Then that day that you get the gig, you can activate the license. It's a no-brainer. Give it a try. Thanks for your support, Source Elements. And we'll see you right after this break. Ooh, I think I heard the voice of a body shop. I did. I did hear the voice of a body shop. Beetle body shop. Well, I've been looking forward to having Simon on for quite a while because it's been a while since we've talked to him. But now with that new studio, that's really, really cool. It is impressive. Nice yeah, work there. Absolutely. We have a bunch of donors of the week, and who might they be? Gee, let me take a look. <laughs> I'm going to kill time while I go back to the show notes. There we go. Um, Sarah Borges, Mike Gordon, Stephanie Sutherland, Shauna Pennington-Baird, Harlow Rodriguez, Michael Kearns, Christy Burns, Brian Rausch. Uncle Roy Yokelson of Antland Productions and Michelle Blinker. Oh. It seems like I read those names almost every show. It's every other week. Now, there's, it seems like, it, well, whatever. If you'd like They're to donate. Subscription. Yeah, that's, that's right. the point. That's, that's the great part. <laughs> they of are on subscription and they do uh, donate regularly. And you can do that if you like or just one time if you particularly like the guest or the topic. 
right on the website, VOBS.TV. Right. It says donate here or donate now, I think is what it says. Uh, or hey, do not. That's right. Hey, show us your booths. By the way, this is Henry Howard's editing studio. If those of you thinking we're sitting in my own studio here, the scale might be a little bit weirder. No, this one, this one here. Oh, you know, and 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 you're on, on fake on the monitor. I'm confused. Yeah, he's got these loudness meters here. This is an editing studio, not really a voiceover studio so much. But uh, hey, he sent it to us. It's a beautiful picture, and it's in landscape, not portrait. So send those send those into us so you can show us your studio. We got to see Simon's studio tonight. Anyway, we did. Yeah. Uh, one. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to we we'd love to say hey come see our show live but that's not going to be possible for at least a month I think until we're past yeah. this this quarantining and stuff uh, anyway yeah. but we do need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's Voiceover Essentials also Voiceover Extra Source Elements Vo Heroes uh, VoiceActorWebsites.com and and jmc demos all right and of course the dan and marcy leonard foundation for the betterment of live and recorded webcasting uh jeff holman for doing a great job in the chat room tonight and our technical director who just made it absolutely perfect tonight sue merlino thanks so much sue for for doing that and of course lee penny for just being lee penny all we right. almost got to your question lee sorry yeah <laughs> it's a little too late maybe he'll get to it on facebook anyway that's going to do it for us Tech Talk is coming up next, so stay tuned for that. You got to know something. If it sounds good. It is good. All right. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. All right. We'll see you next time.